Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to the second lecture of the subject business law on the topic introduction to contract and essentials of a valid contract part 2 I am Dr Rama Bansal working as assistant professor at Arya College Ludhiana This project is sponsored by DTH Swayam Prabha MHRD New Delhi In this chapter we are going to cover the various essentials of a valid contract in our previous lecture we have covered the two components first two components that is offer and acceptance and the legal relation in this chapter we will cover the another three components named consideration capacity of parties and free consent let's start with our presentation i am going to cover the third component consideration uh, we are discussing the various essentials for a valid contract among those essentials the third one is the consideration first of all it's important to know that what is consideration according to pellock consideration is the price for which the promise of other is bought and the promise thus given for value is enforceable if i talk in very general terms consideration means something in return when a contract is made there should be some consideration in return for that promise made by both the parties section 2d of indian contract act also defines consideration as when at the desire of the promiser the promisee or any other person has done or abstained from doing or does or abstained from doing or promises to do or abstained from doing something such act is called a consideration for the promise let's take an example a promises to maintain b's child and b promises to pay rupees 20000 yearly for this purpose here the promise of each party is the consideration for the promise of other party a has promises a has promised to maintain b's child and for that consideration for for that thing he is getting rupees 20000 yearly so that means each act is supported by the consideration so what i have said that consideration is something in return is proved here next we come to essentials of a valid consideration when we can say that the consideration given in the contract is a valid consideration among the essentials of a valid consideration the first point is it must move at the desire of the promiser the law says that the uh, consideration must move at the desire of the promiser if consideration moves at the desire of third party it can never be a valid consideration the consideration may be uh, the the desire of the promiser may be express or implied but in case of the gracious services rendered by the promisee the this is not enforceable let's take an example uh, a sees that b is drowning and he saves the life of b but in this case as a as b has never told him to save his life a has done this act graciously so in this case a can never demand any kind of consideration from b to save his life but if b wants to give him something in return it can be done but this act without the desire of the promiser as in case as in uh, as in case of this example is not enforceable but when a promise to subscribe to a charitable object is made this is again unenforceable but the remaining situation is that the other person the other party has not may has not taken any obligation on the basis of that promise let's discuss the case of abdul aziz versus muzam ali what happened in this case mr d has promised to mr p that he would pay rupees 500 for building a mosque but later on he did not paid any money and in this case mr p has sued that 
he has mr d has promised to pay rupees 500 for building of mosque queue but now he is not paying that money and in this case the court said that as mr p has not taken any kind of obligation on the promise of mr d he has not yet done anything on the basis of the promise given by mr d so this act is again unenforceable but if uh, the other party the promisee has undertaken a liability on the faith of the promiser then the act would definitely be enforceable and this point is clear in case of uh, the kedarnath versus gauri muhammad what happened in this case uh, d agreed to pay rupees 100 for the construction of town hall and on that promise mr p has taken some contracts he has promised some obligations just on the faith of just on the promise of the promiser that he is going to contribute rupees 100 for construction of town hall and later on mr d denied to pay that money in that case what happened? happened mr p went to the court and court said that because promisee has undertaken a liability on the faith of the promiser so this act is enforceable mr d is liable to pay to the uh, promisee that is mr p the next point is the consideration must be real if we want to make a valid consideration the consideration must be real let's take an example if somebody says if you do something for me i will match two parallel lines as we all know the parallel lines can never be matched so this kind of consideration which is totally impossible which is not real is uh, would not be counted as the valid consideration next point it must move from the promisee or any other person uh, the third point the third valid essential says that the consideration must move from the promisee or any other person or any other person would be with the consent of the promisee only at the desire of the promiser only but in case of england uh, it is only it it only moves from promisee only in india and uh, this can move from the promisee or any other person at the desire of the promiser but in england it moves only from promisee only and this can be well explained in the case of chinaya versus ramaya what happened in this case an old lady gifted her all property to her daughter and said that uh, in lieu of all that property she has to give a certain sum of money to her maternal uncle and the daughter also agreed for that she also made the executions she 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 also she was also willing to do that and she promised that that she would give certain sum of money to her maternal uncle but what happened later on she denied to give any money so in india in this case the the uncle who is not a who is not a promiser not a promisee but can enforce the case but in case of england he would not be able to enforce that case it means in india the consideration may move from promisee or from any other person next point is the consideration must be lawful the consideration which is given in the contract in lieu of some promise that must be lawful it is unlawful when it is forbidden by law any act which is forbidden by law if it is being done as a consideration it cannot be a lawful consideration is of such a nature if permitted it would defeat the provisions of law if such kind of consideration is being given which is not permitted by provisions of law let's take an example of the contract between two uh, enemy countries to align enemy countries if such kind of contract is being made such kind of consideration is being done which which would defeat the provisions of law it can never be the uh, valid consideration if the consideration is fraudulent it is not lawful if it involves injury to person or property of another even then this is this consideration is not a lawful consideration let's take an example uh, if someone promises that uh, i will uh, I, I will kill mr a if b marries to c right there is a consideration which involves injury to another person 
in that case such kind of consideration is totally unlawful this consideration would not be a valid consideration next is if the consideration is against the public policy in case of smuggling contracts in case of ducati uh, contracts all these kind of considerations paid that are totally unlawful that means if there is unlawful consideration that would never be considered as a valid consideration next is the consideration may be past present or future but in english law consideration should be present or future only let's take one example uh, to explain the present past and future consideration uh, for the past consideration the consideration is paid in past and the act is to be done in future that means consideration is paid before the act is being done and in case of present consideration the consideration and the act both are to be performed in present only and in case of future the act is being done now but the consideration for that would be paid in future so in india three type of consideration is quite possible that is past present or future but in case of english law consideration can only be present or future next is consideration need not to be adequate yes we we uh, we agree that the consideration should be there but the consideration need not to be adequate let's take an example mr a has a car which is of worth rupees 5 lakh but mr b is selling his car to his cousin for rupees 2 lakhs that means the value of the consideration is far less than the actual value of the car but now in that case if the ownership of car is transferred to the cousin of mr a in that case the cousin has to pay rupees 2 lakh to mr a that means there is a consideration and this is a valid consideration consideration may not be adequate means if if consideration is being received less than the actual amount this is even a valid consideration this but the consideration must be there next is it must be something which the promisor is not already bound to do if the consideration is paid for those contracts for those agreements where the promisor is already bound to do that that is not a valid consideration let's discuss the example a a promise to pay money to police officer to investigate into crime as we all know the duty of the police officer is to investigate into the crimes but if the police officer is being paid uh, to to do his duty that means if mr a is paying mr two police officer to investigate into a crime the agreement was considered to be invalid as we all know the officer was already bound to do that he is not doing anything extra which is not the part of his duty so that means if under consideration something is being paid to the promisor for which the promisor is already bound to do that is not a valid consideration now we discuss the concept of stranger to consideration and stranger to contract in india uh, the promisor or promisee or any other person can sue for the consideration that means any other person except the promisee can also go for the consideration but according to english law the stranger to consideration can't sue the contract as we have discussed in case of chinaya versus ramaya now we come to the, uh, the the concept of stranger to contract any person who is not the party of contract it would be known as stranger to contract a stranger to contract cannot sue except in following cases means stranger to contract can sue for the consideration for the for, for the fulfillment of the promise but except in few cases uh, we are going to discuss all those cases first case is the trust in case of trust a stranger to contract can sue for it let's take an example a give his property to b his son in consideration that b would pay a village and a certain sum of money to c who is a stranger to contract he would pay to a certain sum of money and a village to c other illegitimate son of mr a in this case 
if Mr. B denies to pay anything to Mr. C who is an illegitimate son of Mr. A and a stranger to contract, in this case, Mr. C can sue for the property and that certain sum of money as Mr. A has transferred his property to Mr. B on the trust that he would give a certain sum of money and a village to his illegitimate son. Second is when provision is made in marriage settlement. Third is when provision is made in a partition of a family. Let's take an example where a mother has two sons and both of the sons have agreed that they would pay a certain son of sum of money to her mother for his monthly um, uh, monthly maintenance and here if if one of the son don't pay he denies to pay later on after the contract and here the mother who is a stranger to contract can sue for that amount because the mother is a beneficiary in this account that means where the provision is being made in the partition of a family and then the stranger to contract in in my example the mother can sue for that amount which is which which was settled for her in a contract between two brothers next is where a charge is created in favor of stranger to contract on immovable property where the stranger to contract is a beneficiary in a contract of immovable property in that case stranger to contract can sue for that amount Next, contracts entered into by agents. Uh, where, the, uh, where the contract is done by the agent and between the second party. Now, here the principal is stranger to contract. But because agent is working for his principal, they here if, if something wrong goes on in future, the stranger to contract, that means principal, can sue for the amount pending. Next, we come to uh, we we come to the concept of no consideration, no contract. Normally, we say that that there there must be some consideration when we make a contract. Without consideration, there is no contract. The contract would not be a valid contract. But in few cases where there is no consideration, even then there is a contract. So we are going to read no consideration, no contract ex exceptions under section twenty. 5 of Indian Contract Act 1872. Among those exceptions, the first one is Natural Love and Affection, Section 25, Subsection 1. Uh, natural love and affection uh, uh, must be uh, must be the case where something is being done because of just natural love and affection. But there must be some conditions which must be satisfied under under section 25 subsection 1. First is the, the contract done was expressed in writing. First, second, it is registered under law. Third is the, the contract was done or, or something was done on account of natural love and affection. And it was done between the parties standing in a near relation to each other. Let's say something. Let's uh, define it by example. Uh, if a father has done something for his son. So that means they, they have a very close relationship. If father has given, her, given his property to his son without the consideration, that means this contract is a valid contract because it is being done under the natural love and affection. But it must go for all the, uh, all the necessary, necessary things which I have mentioned here. Next is the compensation for service rendered. Suppose someone has uh, uh, has done the services. Now, now it's now if it if the person is being paid now for those services which he has already rendered, uh, already rendered voluntarily. The main thing here is the voluntarily. Then section uh, twenty five subsection two says that this act this contract is a valid contract even without the consideration, but with the few necessary things one is the one is the the act must have done voluntarily there was a legal obligation to do that promiser must agree now to compensate the promisee here the here the best example can be the founder of the lost goods 
if if some founder has found the lost goods he has the legal obligation to return those goods to the actual owner and he has done it voluntarily but now if promisor wants to compensate that promisee on some gracious grounds then it is a, it is perfectly a valid contract even without the consideration next is time bar debt time bar debt uh, under section 25 subsection 3 are valid but it must be in writing and it must be signed by the promisor next completed gifts if someone has gifted his or her property to to the another person without something in return this is totally a valid contract next is agency as i have explained uh, um, ex explained earlier like if agent is working on the behalf of his principal and if something is done on the behalf of principal on the gracious basis this is called as a perfectly uh, valid contract next guarantee if someone is giving guarantee for another without taking anything in return even then this is a valid contract and if somebody is accepting the less amount than uh, less amount in lieu of the services uh, services rendered let's take an example uh, mr a has uh, sold his uh, his mobile for rupees 1000 but in actual when he was receiving the money he is receiving just rupees 800 he is remitting rupees 200 and this remission of 200 is without any consideration even then this is a valid contract that means in in these seven cases without the consideration the contract can be a valid contract so this is all about the consideration we have covered three basic points till now first two we have discussed in our previous lecture that was offer offer and acceptance and legal relationship and in this lecture we have covered the point that is the uh, consideration now we move to the fourth point that is the capacity of parties section 11 of indian contract act 1872 defines that every person is competent to contract who is of the age of majority according to the law to which he is subject and who is of sound mind and is not disqualified from contracting by any law to which he is subject that means uh, every person who enters into a contract must be capable of becoming a party of contract now what we mean by the capable what we mean by the capacity of parties every person who is entering into the contract may not be capable of doing that contract now who are the incompetent to contract who can't make the contract there are three number of those one is the minor second is the person of unsound mind and third is persons disqualified by any law to which they are subject let's discuss them in detail the first one is capacity of parties the first thing the first person who is not capable of making a contract is a minor according to indian majority act 1875 minor is one who has not completed his or her 18th year of age the indian contract act says that any contract done with the minor minor who has not attained the 18th year of age who has not completed the 18th year of age the contract done by that person is void ab initio void ab initio in other words it's not a valid contract now what happen if somebody has done the contract with the minor person the effect of minors agreement the first effect is that it is a void ab initio void ab initio means the contract done by uh, done with the minor is totally void at from the very initial the uh, the court the law never that uh, takes it as a valid contract and this can be explained in case of mohiri baby versus dharmodas ghosh what happened a ha a was a minor 
he has borrowed rupees 20000 from b as a security for as a security he has um, executed a mortgage in his favor but later on when he uh, attained the age of majority he said that he was minor at that time when he borrowed the money so this so so he should not return the money to mr uh, to mr b and the court also said that when the contract was made when the money was given to mr uh, mr a uh, he was a minor now at this time the money should not be returned to mr b so that means in even in this case uh, the court said that the 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 contract done with mr a was void ab initio this was totally void from the initial step so this means the contract done with minor can never be said as a valid contract next is contracts beneficial to a minor can be enforced by minor but yes here the court gives the benefit to the minor that where in a contract the minor is a beneficiary he can enforce that contract in any condition if the contract is being done between two persons minor may not be the party of the contract but if the minor is a beneficiary under that contract he can enforce that contract so in short what we can conclude that the contract with minor is totally void ab initio that means it's it's a void contract it can never be considered as a valid contract now let's discuss the second point no estoppel against minor where a minor by misrepresenting his age has induced someone to enter into a contract uh, he cannot be made liable on that contract reason being this is the the, the contract with minor uh, is totally a void ab initio as we have discussed in the previous uh, point uh, it means that he is not ex he is not uh, uh, stopped from pleading his infancy in case of contract the contract may direct minor to restore the property if the minor has that property at the present this can be done next no prop no liability in contract in case of torts even the court even the court says that in case of torts uh, the minor cannot be held liable next is no rectification uh, the contract made by minor even cannot be rectified on attaining the age of majority uh, on a on attaining the age of majority that means let's take an example if the minor has done any contract when he was minor on the age on the attaining the age of majority if he says that now i will resign this contract i, I will resign this contract this provision is not given by the law that means on attaining of majority even a minor cannot rectify the contract if because the reason behind it that when the contract was made it was a void contract and the law does not allow uh, to rectify the void agreements next is minor can be a promisee or beneficiary uh, if the minor is a promisee or beneficiary in any case this this can be uh, enforced at law this can be explained with the help of a case of General American Insurance Company Limited versus Madan Lal Sonu Lal. What happened in this case? Uh, a. A minor has insured his goods. But later on his goods got damaged uh, due to some uncertainty. In that case what happened? Uh, he has sued the company for claiming the price, claiming the insurance of goods. And the company take, took the plea that the, the person who has insured the goods was minor. And now the court says that as he was minor but he is a beneficiary in this case. So he can enforce and the amount for goods must be paid to the minor. That means where a minor is a promisee or beneficiary he can enforce the case. Next, no specific performance except in certain cases. Uh, that means where the where the contract is being done with the minor there the the specific performance can't be demanded from the minor except in few cases for example only those cases can be uh, can be uh, enforced where there the the minor is a beneficiary no insolvency that means a minor person can never be declared insolvent by the 
court because that cannot be the party of contract. Partnership under section 30 of Indian Partnership Act, minor can be admitted for benefits of partnership. That means he can never be admitted as partner, but the minor can be admitted into the partnership only for the benefits of partnership. Minor can be an agent. Uh, the minor can work for his principal as an agent, but the minor will not be liable to his principal. One, second, minor can endorse negotiable instrument without himself being liable. In all these cases, uh, the principal would be liable for all the acts done by the uh, minor person who is the agent of the principal. That means minor can be appointed as an agent. Surety for a minor, any person can give can give guarantee for a minor that means he can be the surety for a minor next is minor as shareholder minor uh, can cannot be a shareholder directly but he can be a shareholder through his lawful guardians minor cannot bind a parent on or guardian uh, if minor has done something minor has purchased something he he cannot bind his parents means his parents or guardians are not liable to pay anything to the other party uh, with, with whom the minor has made the contract joint contract yes in joint contract minor can be a party but the whole responsibility would lie on the person who is a who is of the majority age <coughs> Next is liability for necessities, uh, where the minor has done something, where the minor has purchased something, which are the necessities, there the minor can be enforceable, minor is enforceable, but, but he is not liable of the price more than the value of the necessities. Let's take an example. <clears throat> If minor has purchased from shop uh, various things, among those there are some necessaries and some, and some are other things. In that case, minor can be enforceable only for the values, only for the value of the necessaries. But here again, no personal liability of minor is liable, but only his property is liable for the payment of the necessities. Next, we come to the second part, second, uh, second party who is incapable of making the contract that is persons of unsound mind. Section 12 lays down that a person is aid to be of sound mind for the purpose of making a contract. If at the time when he or she makes it, he is capable of understanding it and of forming a rational judgment as to its effect upon his interest. Which means, ki, which means court, court says that when a person makes a contract, he should be able to understand the terms, he should be able to understand the consequences of that contract. But if any person who is of unsound mind is not able to understand all the consequences of that particular contract, so he can never be considered has the capacity to enter into a contract. Unsoundness of mind may arise from idiocy, lunacy, drunkenness, hypnotism or mental decay. Now what are these terms? The first term is idiocy. Idiocy is called the, the absence of the mental development in which the person is incapable of understanding the complexities of a contract. So in that case the person is considered a person of unsound mind and the person is not able to enter into a contract. Second is lunacy. Lunacy is basically uh, is the uh, that is also called insane uh, in which the person uh, the person has some brain disease and due to that, 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 that disease the person is not able to understand the complexities and is considered as incapable of entering into a 
contract next is drunkness drunkness is basically a temporary uh, incapacity of a person which creates impotency of mind and in that duration and in, and in that particular time period when when he is drunk the person is considered as person of unsound mind next is hypnotism hypnotism is under the uh, 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 under the impact of artificial sleep under which the person can't think what is right what is wrong and uh, and during that duration the person is uh, is not capable of entering into a contract and last is a mental decay with the passage of age sometimes people don't understand the the basics of contract or they are not capable of doing the thing so properly so in that case even though the persons are considered as persons of unsound mind that means the court says that the the indian contract act 1872 says that when any person is of among these five the person would be considered as of unsound mind and is not able to under to, and, and is not capable to enter into a contract as party of contract next is persons disqualified by law to which they are subject it refers to statutory disqualifications imposed on certain persons in respect of their capacity to contract means due to some statutory disqualifications person can't enter into a contract he can't be a party to contract among those the first one is the align enemies let's take an example if 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 the two parties are from two different countries where there is a situation of war where their countries are enemies and if they want to enter into a contract this would not be possible they can't be the party of the contract next is a foreign souvenirs and minors that again where there is a foreign winners and the court the statutory uh, there is a statutory disqualification upon those persons and they can't be the party of the contract then the insolvents insolvents declared by the court they they are the persons which can never um, which, which can cannot be a party of the contract till they clear their status next convicts all the convicts while undergoing their imprisonment can't enter into a contract they don't have a capacity to be a party of contract last is a corporation and companies being they are the artificial persons the the, the corporations and the companies uh, itself they they their self can't enter into a contract they work with their persons they work with, they work with their managing team their managing team can enter into a contract but a corporation and a company being the artificial person can't be the party to the contract so these are all the persons who cannot be a party of contract among those we have discussed minors we have discussed the persons of unsound mind and the persons disqualified by law they can never be a party to contract now we move to the next point which is a uh, essential for a valid contract that is a free consent section 13 defines consent as two or more persons are said to be in consent when they agree upon the same thing in the same sense normally uh, when we when we say that consent consent means they are agreeing upon the same thing but that consent must be a free consent what we mean by the free consent the parties to contract should only not have identity of mind but the consent of parties must also be real and free means whenever any party of the contract says that yes i am due to this contract he is he must have the identity of mind first thing but that consent must be real section 14 says that consent is said to be free when it is not caused by coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation or the mistake means when any consent in the contract is given and which is caused by the coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake they can never be said that this is a free consent means in short the consent should be on on the identity with the identity of mind as well as the consent should be real and free next 
now as we have told that when the consent is under the influence of coercion this is not a free consent now what is a coercion coercion is a threat or force used by one party against another for compelling him to enter into an agreement that means when one party by using of threat by using of force uh, force uh, compels the others to enter into a contract this is not a valid contract uh, section 15 defines coercion as the committing or threatening to commit any act forbidden by indian penal code or an unlawful detaining or threatening to detain any property to the prejudice of any person with the intention of inducing any person to enter into the agreement uh, it further covers acts forbidden by indian penal code and unlawful detaining of property let's discuss them in detail first is acts forbidden by the indian penal code all the acts which is which are forbidden by indian penal code are are uh, are covered under this they are under the coercion let's take uh, let's discuss this with the case case of ranga nayakama versus alwar seti what happened in this case a young hindu widow of 13 years of age who has just lost her husband was compelled to adopt a son under the threat of not removing the body of her husband for cremation and at that time she agreed to adopt a son but later on when it was sued the court said that because she has given her consent under the coercion under the coercion of not removing the body of her, her husband for cremation so her consent was not free so so the the adoption was not binding on her if she don't want to have that she can she she is free of that adoption it means anything which is against the indian penal code and the contract made under this can be a voidable contract second uh, the uh, any, any contract where the consent is obtained at the point of pistol there is a threat of imprisonment there is a threat of committing suicide if the all these contracts are being done this is against the indian penal code and can never be considered as the valid contracts second is unlawful detaining of property uh, unlawful detaining of property for this we can discuss the case of muthaiya chetiar versus karoppan chetty what happened in this case uh, the agent refused to hand over books of accounts to the new agent till the principal uh, till the principal uh, released him from all the past liabilities here the agent said till you release me from all the past liabilities i would not hand over the accounts to a new agent and here the principal agrees for that that means his uh, his his accounts were with the agent so have so he have to agree here that he will release him from all the past liabilities but later on when he, he when he has not released and the agent sued for that then the court said that because the consent given here was not a free consent the consent was given because of there was a unlawful detaining of his property his accounts so in this case this consent this contract act was not binding on the principal as the consent given in this case was influenced by the coercion and coercion may proceed from a stranger to contract to let's take an example a said to b if you don't marry me i will i i would kill c who is a sister of b that means if any person who is stranger to contract if the coercion works there even that is uh, that is not binding upon the person who is making a contract just because of that the, that that the person is in, is under the threat under the coercion so th under the coercion any consent given if any consent is given that contract is never be a valid contract 
Next component of free consent is undue influence. Now, what is undue influence? Section 16 provides that a contract is said to be induced by influence where the relations subsisting between the parties are such that one of the parties is in a position to dominate the will of the other and uses the position to obtain an unfair advantage over the other. In other words, when the consent of the party to an agreement is obtained by undue influence, the contract so concluded is voidable. Means when one person is in a position to dominate the will of the other person, he is in a position to influence his or her consent. That means the consent is given under undue influence. And any contract made under undue influence is totally voidable and voidable at the option of the party whether he wants to perform that contract or not later on. As per section 16 subsection 2, a person is deemed to be in a position to dominate the will of another. The person can dominate the will of another only in few exceptional cases. One is where he holds apparent authority over the other. For example, relationship between owner and servant, public officer and accused etc. Means when the owner when the owner uh, owner is there and he is in a position to dominate the will of the servant because servant is totally binding totally uh, dependent upon his owner for his living that means owner is in a position to dominate the will of servant and under the undue influence of owner if servant has done something servant has given his consent that means his consent cannot be considered as a free consent and it the 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 contract would be voidable on the option of the servant whether he wants to perform it or not second in case of fiduciary relationship fiduciary relationship what is the fiduciary relationship that means it is a relationship of mutual trust and confidence sometimes in the relation of trust and confidence one has the power to dominate to will of the other persons like for example the relationship of father and son father can convert the willingness of a son by by, by using his mutual trust and confidence into that relationship he has he the father is in a position to dominate the will of his son the doctor doctor the relationship between doctor and patient here the doctor is in a position to dominate the will of the patient similarly the relationship of guardian and ward that means where there is a fiduciary relationship the one party has the capacity to dominate the will of the other party next when where mental capacity of the party is affected due to age or illness sometime um, there are old old persons uh, let's take an example of a mother and a son if a mother is of very old age in that case uh, because of age because of her illness she she has lost her mental capacity to think upon the things so in that case the other person the son the daughter may have the position to dominate the will of that mother so that means in all in in all these cases where there the mental capacity of the party is influenced by the age or illness then in, in all those cases there the 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 domin the position of the one party is there which can dominate the will of the another party so so here the so here we can't say that the contract is a uh, the the contract has a free consent the third component under the free consent is a fraud according to section 19 what is a fraud fraud means the misrepresentation of the fact with intention to deceive the other party when one party is doing something and the intention is totally to deceive the other party that means there is a component of fraud according to section 17 what is the meaning of fraud fraud includes a false suggestion as to a fact known to be false which in legal language is called as suggestio falsi this is clear from the case of peak versus gurne what are the facts of the case here uh, the, uh, the the prospectus of one company uh, shows only the colorful pictures of their assets and does not disclose the liability part 
and when when the uh, when the prospectus does not show the um, liability part the the, the 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 general public thinks that the the company has a very sound situation the company has very sound position so in that case they the 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 investors has invested the company later on when this is this is being revealed that company has high level of liabilities and then the court said then the court said that because here the liabilities were not being shown in the in the prospectus intentionally means the intention of the company was to deceive the other parties that means this would be covered under the fraud and if someone has given the consent to enter into a contract with the company on the basis of the information given in the prospectus this is totally at the option of the other party to move into the contract or not to move second is active concealment of the fact where someone has actively concealed the facts there uh, the then there the consent by other person will be considered as the consent taken by the fraud let's take an example a a horse dealer sold a mare to b a a horse dealer sold a mare to b knowing that mare had a cracked hoof which he filled uh, so that the other party cannot detect that b later on discovered that there was th that the mare had a cracked hoof and this as a result agreement could be avoided by b that means when the b had discovered that he was uh, he was given the mayor under the fraud he can avoid the contract that means the the consent of the other party was taken under the fraud the intention was to deceive the first party always knows the facts and the party is willingly the um, the party is the the party is willfully misrepresenting or concealing the facts just with the intention to deceive the other party so in all these cases the consent can never be said that consent is a free consent the promise made without any intention of performing it when someone uh, enters into a contract and he knows that he 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 would not perform the contract in future so this is again the case of fraud for example obtaining of goods with an intention not to pay for it when the goods are being obtained it was priorly known that i would not pay for those goods which i am taking it right now that means this is a contract there is a consent for the contract taken under the concept of fraud next hai uh, act or omission as the law specially declares to be fraudulent any uh, any act is, if it is being done which is under the law specially declares to be fraudulent that is again uh, the concept of fraud any other act fitted to deceive means if some impersonalization is in is there to induce other party to enter into a contract just to deceive with the intention to deceive that is again under the fraud and next is mere silence is not fraud normally uh, normally we say that the there uh, is a caveat emptor caveat emptor means let the buyer be beware sometimes the seller is selling the goods uh, he is uh, um, let's take an example uh, the seller has displayed the displayed the goods on a table the customer comes and 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 he inspects the goods and after inspection if he takes the goods and the seller knows that a few of things out of those table out of the goods displayed on those table are not of good quality or are done or are the damaged goods he don't declare this he don't speak even a word he remains silent this would not be counted as fraud under the principle of caveat emptor as the principle of caveat emptor says that let the buyer be aware the buyer when is inspecting the goods he must take care the goods he must see that that if there are there are any damaged goods or something else is there next component is of misrepresentation what is a misrepresentation the word representation means a statement of fact made by one party to the other party before the contract 
and a wrong representation is called a misrepresentation means before a contract when a presentation when a representation is made then it is okay but when the wrong but when the wrong representation is made this is called the misrepresentation let's take an example a intends to sell his horse to b and say my horse is perfectly sound a genuinely believes that horse to be sound although he does not know that the horse has fallen ill yesterday b thereupon buys the house there is a misrepresentation on the part of a essentials for misrepresentation are the misrepresentation must be of material facts the misrepresentation given in the uh in the in, in the agreement in the contract must be of the material facts if some uh, some misrepresentation is being done on some immaterial facts this is totally immaterial for the contract and contract cannot be uh, cannot be resigned on the basis of this one the misrepresentation must be false but the person making it honestly believe it to be true this is very important point that the misrepresentation made on this part must be the false representation must be the false representation and the person who is making the misrepresentation should make it honestly believe it to be true third point is the misrepresentation must induce the other party to enter into a contract the misrepresentation was made in in the contract the intention was just to induce the other party so that the other party can enter into the contract if some other if if the misrepresentation is being done with some other intentions this would not be counted as a misrepresentation it must have been made by either by party himself or by his agent this is again a very important point the misrep the 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 fact to the misrepresentation must be made by one of the parties or the agent of the principal because agent works on uh, agent works on the behalf of the principal this is equally good but when the when any misrepresentation is made by some third party this would not be the uh, on on this basis the contract cannot be enforced let's take an example mr a and b are making uh, are, are the parties of the contract and are into the terms of contract and when mr b asks about the quality of the goods rather than mr a mr c has given some misrepresentation that means the party of the contract was mr a and mr b and the misrepresentation is given by mr c that means if the later on mr b founds that there were the there were some problem with the goods and at at the time of contract mr c has given the misrepresentation and if now mr b wants to cancel the contract the he he cannot cancel as in this example the misrepresentation was made by mr c the third party who was not a party of the contract so on that basis this contract cannot be cancelled so this is about the misrepresentation now we come to the last component of the free consent that is the mistake now what is the mistake the term mistake may be defined as incorrect belief about something it takes place where the concerned parties are not fully aware of the terms of the agreement and they take the term in the different sense mistake may be of two types mistake of law and mistake of fact so what is the mistake of law when when something is done uh, by mistake but that is the, the the mistake is just the misunderstanding of the law this is called as mistake of law this can be further of two types one is mistake of general law of country mistake of foreign law love the first point is mistake of general law of country when the mistake is made uh, uh, regarding the law of the country regarding the um, the, the various provisions uh, of the law of a country this is called as mistake of general law of country country means 
uh, the the country of the parties involved for example if there are two parties involved into a contract both are indian that means if contract is made under indian contract act 1872 and any mistake is made made in that contract so that mistake should be uh, the, that mistake of law should be against the indian contract act next is mistake of foreign law if some mistake is being made uh, in the in, in understanding of the foreign law so that would be considered here second is the mistake of fact mistake of fact may be of again two kinds one is a bilateral mistake second is a unilateral mistake when the both of the parties have undergone the mistake when the both parties are under mistake that is called as bilateral mistake when the one party has mistaken when the only the one party is mistaken and one party is doing his or her part rightly this is called as unilateral mistake let's discuss uh, the bilateral mistake and unilateral mistake in some detail a uh, bilateral mistake happens when the two parties are in the mistake but the major thing is that should be a mistake of fact not a, not mistake of law first thing second thing is the mistake must be regarding the formation of contract let's take an example uh, mr a was selling his watch to mr b for rupees 2000 and mr b uh, thought that it is of 200 this is not a mistake this is a mistake of one party that is a unilateral it is not a mistake of both the parties this is when the both parties are mistaken that is called as bilateral mistake but when the mistake is on the part of a single party as i have given the example the watch was of 2000 but mr b was taking it as rupees 200 the mistake was on the part of mr b not at the part of mr a this type of mistake is called as unilateral mistake This is a combined table which shows the effects of the uh, various uh, various components of free consent when the consent is not free when it is caused by coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake uh, see uh, we have discussed that when the consent is consent is not given freely uh, it can uh, it, it can has various uh, effects on the Uh, on the forcibility of the contract let's see in the chart in the first four components coercion undue influence fraud and misrepresentation the effect of four is the contract is voidable contract is voidable that means it is at the option of the other party whether they want to continue the contract or they want to resign the contract it is totally at the will of the party concerned but when we talk about the fifth component that is a mistake in this case the effect is that contract is void that means any contract made with mistake uh, either the bilateral mistake or uh, the unilateral mistake or uh, it is a mistake of law or mistake of fact any kind of mistake if present in the contract and the contract is made the effect is only that the contract would be void means this contract cannot be enforced that means uh, till now we have discussed the five components of the essentials of a valid contract Uh, let me revise it for you all as discussed in the summary part also in this chapter we have discussed the consideration capacity of parties under which we have discussed three major points minor persons of unsound mind and persons disqualified by law and under the fifth point of free consent we have discussed the five components that is coercion undue influence fraud misrepresentation and mistake This is the end of this lecture thank you so much